Well, welcome to our We Choose to Thrive interview series. Everyone on this um, interview is an author in our book, We Choose to Thrive. We are so excited about being able to share our messages. I wanted to read a couple of quotes we'll set, that will set the tone for this interview today. And one of my favorite authors and speakers, amazing person, is Brene Brown. And this is what she said, I do not owe my past a place in my future. And then she says, the irony is that we attempt to disown our difficult stories to appear more whole and more acceptable. But our wholeness, even our wholeheartedness, depends on the integration of all of our experiences, even our balls. So setting the tone for our interview today, Marianne Williams says one of the, the greatest fears that we have is that we are inadequate, but we aren't. We are very strong, beautiful women, and we are so happy to be here to share with you. So we have with us today, we have Edna White, who is a writer, a speaker. She's an ordained evangelist and a very gifted, inspirational speaker, and she writes many self-help books. Her own story is that she has published this stuff, Giving Voice to the Secret. Welcome, Edna. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have Shannon Gardner, who is one lady that is very determined to make a difference. Shannon, like many of us, have, has lived her life with a secret, one, that, one of those secrets that you just don't dare to talk about. And, um, but she has always been very, very focused on making sure that she is improving herself, and she's done an amazing job. In fact, you're going to soon be on, is it The Voice? Um, yes, I'm auditioning um, Saturday. For The Voice. Yes. Pretty exciting. Oh, very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have Roberta Brown. She's been rich. She's from Minneapolis, raised there. Um, she's reinvented herself and has started her own business as a marketing consultant and client services director. She's written and published her own book called The Shooting, A Story of Resilience and Hope. Barry, congratulations to you. Roberta. Thank you. Tracy Bogan. She is the first the world's first dreampreneur and a leading expert on goal mastery and self-empowerment. I met Tracy through a networking event and became one of her coaching clients and has made a huge difference in my life. She is a she herself is a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And she spearheaded a campaign to increase the criminal statute of limitations for sex crimes for children. Her grassroots efforts helped her change Wisconsin's law on child sexual abuse. It's called the, the, the Bogan Bill. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Um, Amanda, could you tell us a little bit about you because we didn't get your bio. Oh, I, sorry, I thought I got that to you. Um, I am Amanda Thompson, and I own just a home boutique and focus on lingerie and improving the sexual health and wellness of women. Very good. Thank you. And Joe Dibley. We, Joe Dibley is a very, very determined um, to see the change by educating, empowering, and, elevate, and elevating women entrepreneurs. She's a social entrepreneur and is described as tenacious and fearless um, philanthropist with a catalyst to change. Her book, The Best Kept Secrets to In Love, Life, Love, and Business, she has another book, what was it? It was Frock Off. Frock Off. <laughs> Living Life Undisguised. So welcome, ladies, and welcome to our listeners. Um, we're going to start our conversation by asking a question of each of our interviewees. And we'll start with you, Tracy, and just kind of Go around the circle here. What prompted you to share your story with We Choose to Thrive? Pain, suffering, silence, years, decades. And one day, my soul just couldn't bear the heaviness and the weight and the pressure and the secret any longer. So I confided in my best girlfriend, Amy, that I had been sexually abused by two uncles and two neighbors. We all, most of us lived on the same block together. And I was so ashamed and so embarrassed because I felt, even though it was five when I started with, with one, 
and 14 when it ended with the other. At 14, I felt old enough to know better. And it felt good. The attention felt good. And so the shame went around the pleasure that I received from that. And I even denied the age that it stopped to save myself from the embarrassment that I was 14. I should have known better. I was so ashamed that I didn't have, Amy kept pressuring me, or suggesting, suggesting that I let it out and inform my family of what was going on because maybe it was happening with other people. I asked her, <laughs> enlisted her to tell my family for me, my parents. That's how ashamed that I was. And once that happened, the door broke open, my heart broke open, and I felt a sense of freedom. And a couple of my perpetrators confessed when my parents confronted them. And my one uncle said he cut off his right arm. If he could take it back and do it over, he had no idea why he did what he did. And my other uncle apologized to me privately, but publicly he went on to deny it until his untimely death by suicide just very recently. And he would never admit it to his family or to his wife. But when I called him seeking the apology that I remember what you did to me, um, I, I got it, and that was enough for me. And so it was pain that really, an aloneness that really led me to either I can't go on this way or something has to change. And there's only two ways that change happens in a person's life, and that's you must do something new or something new must come into your life. And I chose to do something new and let out the secret. And, and that's why I decided to share the story. These things, thank you, Tracy. These things can color our world for a very long time. You know, so thank you for sharing that. Joe. For myself, uh, mine was more, I call it stranger danger because it was a foster parent who ended up sadly becoming a serial killer. And um, for myself, it was really... I've always believed that I heal through service, and so mine was what prompted me to change was I had been I was in a dark place myself in terms of feeling sad and wanting it to be different. But I knew if I gave voice to those who couldn't stand, that I would be able to help other people. And because it wasn't family, I think it was. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, but I think it was easier. I think it was easier because I could separate myself from that circumstance or, you know, uh, but just to give voice to those who were voiceless, I think that there are so many of us that are out there that are sad, that have not been heard, have not voiced what's going on. You know, there were 26 girls like me that were assaulted and lived, and of those 26, I was the only one deemed fit enough to stand trial against him, and that in and of itself is it's horrible because a lot of them lost their lives or took their lives. So I just wanted to give voice to others. Well, then you spent, what, 35 years in hiding? 35 years in hiding. I moved 53 times. I've had 19 different names. But I was voiceless for a really long time, and it had to change. And I knew that I wasn't alone, and yet that shame, guilt, all that stuff that comes with it, which is really unfounded on our part, just it's part of the makeup of who we are in terms of when we've been through something, and especially when people don't believe you, which I wasn't believed when I told the police. So, you know, it, it was about being that change. To me, it was about being the change that I wanted, which was that we would look at this kind of crime and go, you know what, we've got to give equal weight to the victim or the person who's been victimized, because I don't think I was a victim. I see myself as being victimized. Um, as we do to the perpetrator and protecting their rights. So, yeah, 35 years is a long time to it is away. I, I found a graphic that really explains it well. It's a girl in sunglasses, and the sunglasses are painted white with the writing on it. And it says, the shame that they don't see, the shame they do not know. It's kind of like written in black ink on the lenses. And for most of us that have gone through these things, the shame keeps us so silent. We sip yeah. the lips. We don't want to expose. We don't because we take so much of the guilt of it, even when it was nothing that we did. But we hold on to that guilt because something inherent inside of us says, "This is not good. This is not right." And I don't want the whole world to know. That's why. That's why I was 60 years old before I shared my story. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And well, I think that's what keeps per that's what keeps perpetuating the problem. It is quiet. Yes, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. Edna, mm -hmm. would you share um, what prompted you to share your story with We Choose to Thrive? I think um, the reason why I shared my story with you is because I wanted to um, give a legacy and stop the pain for others and those are my family um, because you never know who's got, what's happening to other people um, in your family and you know because you're so wrapped up in your stuff it could be happening to them and I think I want it better for my grandson, my granddaughter, you know, and the, those that I couldn't, couldn't save while I was going through it. But to broaden it, I wanted to, wanted to share because in the community, in my community, people don't know what you go through. You know, you go through so much, um, and they see the outer shell of it, everything, like the tough exterior. And um, but they don't know what really is the soft, the softness on the inside, and what you've gone through. And I wanted to help other women because it's so prevalent. And I, I know that going through what I've gone through, I'm able to help other people as long as I keep moving forward in the recovery stage and, and acknowledging and realizing who and what I am because it is, it is part of what it's, I am now. You know, every part of it, it is, it's part of me. Mm -hmm. So I have to, all I have to do is learn to turn it around and reprogram that negative part. And I want to do that for other people. I want to share that with other people. Very good. Thank you for sharing with us. Amanda? Um, yeah, for me, I think uh, shame is the big word that does come up as far as why I chose to, to share my story. Um, after years of sexual molestation as a child, I was raped at 14 by a friend's neighbor that she trusted. And I went home that night and I journaled it. I wrote it down and I swore myself to secrecy and I sealed it. And that uh, eventually it unraveled, it came out. And um, as a result, he was put in jail. <clears throat> never served uh, in a trial or anything because he killed himself. He hung himself with his bed sheets. So at 14, I felt like I was a murderer. I should have kept quiet. I should have denied it. And I carried the shame of that for years, years and years and years. And I chose to share with this because it's, it's I guess, my final way of breaking my silence to say I'm not ashamed of it. I forgive him, I forgive myself, and um, hopefully my story will help somebody else. So, thank you, thank you very much, um, Shannon. Um, my biggest thing is is my reasoning is I want to help others because I'm 44. I didn't tell my story till I was 42, I believe, and the the guilt that. I, the, the fear that I felt that whole time, um, once I told my story, because I was scared to tell my story, because I didn't know what people were going to think of me, how they were going to feel about me, were they going to judge me, um, all those questions. And so once I told the story and realized that I'm not at fault, it's, it wasn't my fault, um, then I realized what my mission was is to help others. And once I told and I had women reach out to me, I was blown away by how many women reached out to me and how many of my friends had been abused and did not tell anybody. So my biggest thing is, is I just want to make sure that women out there know that this is not their fault. They didn't ask for it and they need to feel good about themselves and not worry. So that, that's my biggest reason. Thank you. It takes us so much courage to stand up and say, you know, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. And Roberta. Hi. Um, well, I decided not to sit on my family secrets anymore. Uh, outwardly, we looked like a typical family, but there was all kinds of things going on behind the scenes, uh, physical abuse and uh, emotional and mental abuse. And um, it was all really difficult, but I didn't really understand that 
we were any different than anybody else because I only lived where I lived and that was my normal. And I really didn't get the, the last piece of the puzzle. I knew there was something off or wrong or whatever. And I had spent years in therapy, 31 years with the same therapist, trying to figure out, dig in and understand my situation. So um, I was 51, I'm now 58. So uh, at 51, I got the last piece of the puzzle. I can tell you where I was sitting. I can tell you the epiphany and how it felt. And um, I, it freed me up uh, because there was the last piece and I understood that none of this was my fault. I didn't own any of it. And about two years later, I was compelled to write my book and share all the secrets and, and really set myself free and stand in my truth. That's, and the book is, and like Becky's book, is to, is to help other people to see their circumstances hopefully sooner than I did. So. Thank, you. Thank you, Roberta. So I'll start the question, next question with you. So in your process of healing, what was your greatest obstacle? Besides myself? <laughs> <laughs> um, Pretty much, yes. <laughs> um, the greatest obstacle was to um, press on and keep telling the truth and facing the truth and um, forgive myself for thinking that this was my fault and to, um, I, I guess, my, my biggest obstacle uh, was I was, when I was writing, I didn't want to trigger anybody else's experiences so that it was really painful for them. Mm -hmm. So I wrote in such a way not to do that. And, um, and I include humor, oddly enough, <laughs> but it's a great coping skill. And um, so I guess, you know, that's a lot of the obstacles that I had, but they didn't stop me. So Very cool. not completely. <laughs> <laughs> Edna, what was your biggest obstacle? I think my biggest obstacle was um, believing uh, or trusting that others would, you know, um, believe in me, you know, um, it was hard to tell the story, you know, and like Roberta, when I wrote my book, I didn't want to trigger anybody. And, um, it was very painful to, to write, but I didn't want to trigger anybody. I wanted to give examples, but not trigger and give guidance and not hurt. So I think that was my biggest, mm -hmm. um, telling the story um, or coming out as it were. <laughs> um, it was pretty tough because I was in a, you know, I was in religion for a very long, long time for a Band-Aid, you know, because I thought that was where I was supposed to be to heal this kind of thing that was going on for me. And even there, telling my story was very difficult. So um, I think just being able to know that my pain is my pain and it doesn't, doesn't matter what everyone else thinks that it should be, I feel my pain is mine and my story is mine. And I had to get that in order to move forward. And most often now I have to grab it back and say, this is my pain, this is my story and move, and move forward. Yeah, and a lot of times one of the strongest considerations that we have is how it's going to affect our families. Yeah, and, absolutely. And it, it's a really, that, that in itself, when I wrote my story, I didn't use names uh, or places, and I was very gentle in how I shared my story, but still affected my family greatly, yeah. you know, so it, that is a really strong consideration. Mm -hmm. Amanda. Um, I think my biggest obstacle, um, and this is this is a really tough question for me because um, going back and forth between a few of them, but um, the biggest one I kept coming back to, I think, was self-forgiveness. Um, being wrapped up in the mindset that I had inadvertently killed somebody, um, I had to really, really work at forgiveness um, first of him at some point, but then I realized even 
when I was in my mid thirties, around my mid thirties or early thirties, um, I had forgiven him, but I had never forgiven myself. Therefore, mm-hmm. I had set myself on a war path of destruction that ultimately ended the, in a divorce. Um, it ended up wreaking havoc on quite a few relationships. And, you know, from that, I had to learn how to do self-trust all over again. So um, it, was, it was a very difficult journey to, to make those self-discoveries. Um, but in doing it, um, it's, it's been very... Uh, I, I don't know what the word is. It's It's been good. It's been really good. Very proud of you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And Shannon? Um, well, I have two that I can, that, that come off at the top. Um, one was my relationships. Um, those have been, not anymore. They're, it's great now, but uh, my biggest hurdles was getting um, a trusting relationship, trusting the other person and having the other person understand. Um, that has been fixed. I have a wonderful husband now. And the second was the week after I told my story. That first week made me reel back into that where I shut down. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want anybody around me. I felt like I was reliving that whole moment of my life. So that first week was really, really a big hurdle to get through. But once I realized that, you know, it's okay, then I came out of it. But those are my two um, biggest hurdles. Well, your first exposure was taking, you used big posters to tell your story, and you posted it on YouTube. It was very very effective. You did a really good job. Thank you. Yeah. And Joe? Uh, you know, for me, when I did tell the police and they didn't believe me and he went on to murder someone I knew, that was my biggest obstacle. Um, because I never saw him physically, like I never saw him again after he stalked me, then I moved away. He would find me, but I didn't see him. He tried to abduct my daughter at one point. Um, because I never saw him again, he remained that young man that had power, that he was strong enough to empower, like to overtake me. I remained in my head that 15 and a half year old girl. And he had said to me, I will kill everyone you love. And I knew he wasn't saying it for the sake of saying it. He meant it. When he killed Susan, it was really hard for me to tell my story. When I wrote Frock Off Living Undisguised, which was back in 2013 that I launched, uh, I can relate to the feeling of being vulnerable and, and being out there very much so because it's, you're, you are reliving it when you tell it. Uh, but the biggest obstacle for me was the fear he would not only find me, but he would kill more people I cared about. So being quiet meant keeping them safe, but in essence, I wasn't keeping anyone safe. That's right. Thank you. Tracy. My biggest obstacle in my life having gone through this experience has been lack of trust, lack of self-love, and being completely shut down in my heart space. I have never been able to, until now, maintain a healthy, happy, exciting love relationship. I'm single, I have no children, I've never allowed anyone to fully see me, Mm -hmm. to fully embrace me or to fully love me, including myself. Mm -hmm. I'm 46 years old and on November 28th, a sonic boom hit my life through some deep cranial sacral work that I was doing and meditation working with quantum pathic center of consciousness. A sonic boom hit my life, and in one instant moment, my heart opened. For the first time in my life, I met my heart. And then my voice opened, and I met my voice. And a few days later, my power opened. And at age 46 in November, I stepped into my power, I stepped into my voice, I stepped into my truth, and I'm in complete full alignment with living my soul's purpose and living my truth that now projects to the message that I've been out speaking with my audience but never really connecting with. And 
<laughs> Only now, at 46, am I willing and open, allowing and trusting for the first time to invite someone into my life to know me, to see me, to honor me, to cherish me, and to love me. And it's because just recently I feel love for myself for the first time. In fact, Amanda and I went hiking a couple of weeks ago and we got to the top of the mountain and we both stood at the top of the mountain yelling, I love myself, I love myself, I love myself. And it was amazing because I felt it for the first time in my life and I was congruent with who I am. And if I could take a pill and never have this experience have shown up or being sexually abused as a child or to em to deny my sexuality my whole life until just now, if I could take a pill and make all that go away, I would not do it because I know that that entire journey and that entire process has led me to, at age 46, finally step into my power, into who I am, into my soul, into my essence, into my being. And now I have the message to project to the world to let others know that you are the conscious creator of your results. And we have a choice every day to choose to live in victimhood or to not only be a thriver, but to actually be a champion of your circumstances and to share your light and your message of your pain and your struggles with others. That's beautiful. Loving ourselves is the greatest gift we can give ourselves. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's the key. And until we can love ourselves, we really cannot love anybody else in the right in the way that we need to. So our next question is, what has been your greatest aha and reward that you've had by sticking to this healing process? We'll start with you, Shannon. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my greatest reward. Um, I think being able to keep going forward and not letting what happened to me affect me anymore, mm -hmm. uh, not blaming myself, and being able to, um, obviously, Becky knows I'm, you know, I've been married a couple of times because <laughs> of what's happened to me. And my reward is I met a great man. I opened up to him. I told him. And he told me it was okay. I'd never had that before. So that to me is great because now I know that I can keep moving forward. I don't have to um, worry about, is this person going to judge me anymore? Is this person going to think I'm disgusting or if I'm um, a horrible person or I'm a liar? So I think just being me is, is actually really, really great. Well, I find that most of the time, for, for many of us, um, we attract only what we know. And many of us have gone through more than one marriage. And, and I know for myself, the husband I'm married to, we just celebrated nine years. Um, when we first met, <laughs> poor man, I was like, he's going to know everything because I'm not going to keep any secret anymore. And, you know, he has lo loved me through every inch of this this way and he stands behind me and back in back of me could is there a phone could we get somebody the phones to not ring <laughs> i hear a phone ringing okay so um it's so true you know but that's all part of beginning to love ourselves and when you have somebody that really just loves you for you and understands exactly what you've gone through and still loves you it's pretty amazing yeah, yeah. How about for you, um, Amanda? What was your greatest aha? Um, my greatest aha was it, uh, establishing trust um, in, in realizing that I needed to forgive myself. And once I did that, then it opened up a whole new world. And um, I was actually able to meet uh, my boyfriend now. And it's it's been wonderful. Like you guys have said, um, he knows absolutely everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, and he's still here. And it's really opened up the doors of being able to trust in him, in others, in my relationships. And most importantly, I've learned to trust in myself. And that has, I think, been my biggest gift to myself is being able to trust 
my decisions, even though they're hard and sometimes I second guess them. Um, I have to kind of give myself little pep talks, you know, mm-hmm. here and there for certain things. But um, I, I ultimately have walked away trusting myself again. Wonderful. That's perfect. Mm-hmm. How about for you? What's your aha, uh-huh, Roberta? Oh, me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my <laughs> wasn't expecting it to be me yet. Uh, my aha moment was when I sent my book out before it was published to a test readership and uh i and that test readership was 25 people some i knew some i didn't and hearing back from two women who said to me how did you know my story and that is when my book became cathartic and positive and it i saw that my intention was exact it came back to me my intention was to help other people and to facilitate dialogue and to to promote healing and here all it took was these two women calling me and saying how did you know my story and then they tell me their story and then tell me they had never talked about it before so i knew that i had done the right thing and that was my aha moment very good. One of the biggest things that we want to see happen is for those that are out there that are have faced this, that are listening to this and picking up these books and reading, is that they don't go to the grave with these deep, deep dark secrets. They set themselves free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Edna, would you share with us? I think my greatest aha moment was knowing one day I was um, at a church speaking um, at a women's group. And I had this whole little script all, you know, how you do, the whole little script all made out. And I think at that moment, I was kind of, I was aligned. And I knew at that moment that I was enough. Mm -hmm. And that my story, when I told my story to this large audience of people that was waiting for a different type of message, that I was enough. And I say I was enough because all those many years I was pretending to be somebody else. And that was the first day that I took off caring about what people felt about who I was and how I acted. I was really real for the first time because I was walking in a facade that everybody wanted me to walk in, saying the things that people wanted me to say, acting the way that people wanted me to act making facial expressions, the, you know, see my face, making fa- facial expressions the way that they felt I should. But I became real that day I, because I felt being enough for me, me, I was enough. You know, with all the hurts, with all the pains, I was me. And sharing my story with those other women, after the this, this service was over, they were coming up, giving me hugs, and saying the same thing like Roberta. Um, you read you you read it right you know that's my story you know i'm so glad that you were able to to tell me like mirror my story and i feel a lot better because you know um a lot of my mission is because i've been in the religious sector is to uncover the voices in in the churches because that's where they, they hide there for me mm-hmm. you know and that was my first aha moment that i'm just real that's just it. I'm just me, and I'm going to go forth and be just be just enough for everyone. You know, I, I'm just me. I, I I don't know how it's so free. <laughs> it's just amazing to be yourself. Um, I've never been this way in my whole life. I'm 52, and I can speak my story to my children, um, which I thought would be ashamed or or give me grief. And, you know, we all, every day is not great. And I had a bad day two weeks ago and I was, it was just a bad day and I was crying and I was, you know, and my oldest son said to me, he said, mom, you did a great job. Now go and save others. You can do this, mom. And I felt so much relief. I was like, here's my son, you know, telling me. <laughs> and it was just so good because 
I was me, you know, I didn't have to pretend not to cry or be strong around them. I was weak around them and they lifted me up. And that's what my aha is. I am me and I'm enough. I'm just so that's enough. so beautiful. That is beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and Joe. Well, you know, just listening to the people that are, you know, all of us that are addressing this, I would say yes, 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 yes. Um, and then some, I guess, for me, because I, I've been working with women entrepreneurs since 2001, and what really amazed me, this is before I even came out, as I call it, uh, is I would, you know, I would be on stage sharing my message, whatever that was at that moment, because remember I had all those aliases, which mean I had a lot of backstories. And I can totally relate to that. I was not myself until I came out, so to speak, okay? Yes. But here's the thing. Those women were coming up to me saying, I'm not good enough. I, I feel like a fraud. I'm an imposter. And I'm looking at them. I'm the daughter of a prostitute, okay? So I'm standing on stage telling them how to live their life, which, by the way, I wasn't being real. But, at, I mean, I was being real as real as I could be in right, my yeah, yeah. I was a very good actress, okay? Yeah. Like, I was a rock star. I could have won an academy. <laughs> anyway, the point that I'm trying to make. Here are these women that I'm looking out, they all look so accomplished and so phenomenal, like mm -hmm. they don't have a hair of a place, you know, I'm hair illiterate. Okay, so let's start there. One, they're coming up to me, like they're sad, they're genuinely sad, they're genuinely doubting yeah. who they are, and if they are enough, and I'm looking at them as like they're rock stars, and I'm thinking, mm -hmm. Okay, but the daughter of the prostitute is talking to them who's had her own story and they're telling me that I I look like I'm like rock star material. I'm like, what is what, what, what can they not be? Right? That was one of my ahas and it lasted like I have a long aha moment, okay? It lasted <laughs> Fifteen years of people are coming out to me telling me that they're I'm all this in the bag of chips and I'm looking at them going, Oh my gosh, what's wrong with you people? But that's the best. Okay, so going, you know, I I use humor a lot. Like I use a lot of dark humor. That's what got me through. But it I'm telling you, this was like a miracle for me. Like, Thank you, God, for showing me that there are a lot of other whack jobs out there like me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on marriage number three, and it's the first time it's a real marriage, so I can understand that. So I'm in the I'm in the club of three. Yes. If you're not there, it's okay. You know, like <laughs> my other aha moment continues to be because of these women, because these women come in, and we stand. All of us that are sharing our story, we stand before people. What I like to say figuratively, naked. Because mm -hmm. we told our story, and in doing so, we empower them to tell their story. And the transformations, and Becky, you know, because you've been to our stuff. But what's happening is these people are standing, and whatever their thing is, just because we stood. So as much as all that stuff I was concerned about before, which, you know, I told you, the daughter of a prostitute, because my father, you know, like there's a lot of stuff around that. But the bottom line is. When I decided to really step in, like you said, Edna, just to be real, to be 100% myself, I have the, the most freedom. When people ask me what's my word, it's freedom. Because freedom is right. rocks, right? Well, I like that. <laughs> you know, that rocks. That's what changed my life, and that's what allows me to live my yeah. own thing. And I think when I, as I keep hearing, of course, like attracts like, okay. But the <laughs> truth is, like the goosebumps, they're going <laughs> so much so the hair standing on it. Oh well, it already was. But anyway, <laughs> I, uh, because, you know, we can serve. And I think the the last point to that is when I had the chance to go back and speak at um, in the city where everything happened, where it just imploded okay the person I was speaking for a fundraiser for the shelter and the woman who had brought me back said Joe you still the city today let me tell you that my heart still when I say that not just it's yeah that's awesome that's a lot of responsibility yeah. right that's a lot of responsibility and as much as I knew I was in that moment I will tell you that every woman that was 
that had been victimized by him in my mind came with me on stage that day. I was not alone. I did not. I may have been the voice, but I was not oh, alone. Yep. That's what we're doing. That's, that's what we, to me, and not this, this, it's about being real. And showing yes. so, anyway, that's my ahas, ahas, ah. <laughs> so I was at, uh, the, when I finally <laughs> made my decision to speak up, I had just made it and then went to one of Joe's events up in the, um, British Columbia. And she started her event with a mastermind and we were divided up into three tables with three different people leading each table and we were asked the question what are we really working on what do we really want to do with our lives and so each one of us had it at the table there was ten at my table would speak and then everyone was given at the table a chance to say this is what you could do this is how I would do this this is what I would resources I would tap into at the end of that, that round, I was chosen to go up and speak in front of the entire group and, and be asked the same question and me tell exactly what I was wanting to do. And I said, it's time for me to tell my story. And what happened is because it was then a larger group, every woman there came up and they had written their suggestion, resources to tap into, that was one of the most life-changing things I have ever experienced. When 30 women come up and hand you a piece of paper and say, this, this is for you. And you look at it and read in the, the suggestions and the, the love that was felt. I still have my stack sitting right here. And I read it from time to time. So the strength that we have in women to impact others' lives is incredible. Mm -hmm. And each one of us are doing it in our own special way. There's no right or wrong way. There's we all do it in our own special way. Mm -hmm. Tracy, what was your aha? <laughs> there have been so many, most of them unseen until the last year. I had been so disconnected from my life and myself and my truth and my purpose pickling my liver and alcohol and life to me was how much fun I could have and I was just so disconnected. Only the last year truly has been so transforming for my self-growth and my personal development and expanding my consciousness with the work that I've been doing. A few of the gifts that I'll share are, I mean, number one is bridging the gap between me and me and really being aligned with my soul's purpose and my truth and my voice and my light and who I am in the world, which will far outlive me. It's a, it's a projection, a projection. It's a, a big value piece for me is having a daily connection and relationship with my perfect child within. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday, very interestingly enough, I meditate 30 minutes every morning and they are just getting more powerful and more profound with breakthroughs that this my five-year-old self says in the meditation in my mind's eye said to me it's your turn to sit down and be quiet for a moment I'm going to take the wheel and be the driver and because I am the heartness of you I'm the soul of you I'm the source I'm the power and when we move forward with our message from this position of me being at the driver's seat instead of my childish adult ego self who thinks she knows everything, <laughs> that's when we'll make headway. That's the rocket fuel that's going to catapult us to where we're into where we're going. And it was so profound that I spent much of the day, much of the morning yesterday, experiencing life in myself through my power source. It was a different, completely different connection than I've ever had. And so large in part, the biggest reward is really self-discovery of me and why I'm here and what I'm intending to do. And I wouldn't change that for anything in the world. I feel whole. Where I spent most of my life feeling it, whole, H-O-L-E, in a hole, empty. And now I'm at a place of feeling whole, W-H-O-L-E. And I feel like I've arrived to a, a, a place called the empty fullness. 
that in the last year I've completely released and have resolved all of the victimizedness that I've experienced, all of the pain, all of the suffering that I've chosen from, from the past until just the other day. And it, it's not a wall that divides, it's just the now that divides, and I feel like I'm on the other side of myself. And I see down the, down the line that it's completely empty and smooth, and it's so full. There's nothing missing. Everything is perfectly in this tube. And if I look behind me, it's all full of black particles of suffering that I've chosen. Mm -hmm. And the road ahead, my empty fullness, I get to create it from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Every experience, every person, every relationship, everything that I choose is truly a choice. And I get to choose what I fill my experiences with. That's the greatest gift and the reward and the aha moment all wrapped into one. And believe me, there's thousands more, but those are my favorite. <laughs> so I guess I'll start the next question with you, Tracy, is, and I think I already know the answer. If you had it all to do over again, would you do anything differently? Absolutely not. The greatest growth for me has been on the other side of the fear about it, of the victimness about it, of the pain about it, of the resolve about it. And it's for me, it's arriving at a place of releasing the resistance. That's been the biggest struggle of my life is releasing the resistance. And when I stand in the place of no resistance, of just being, of just experiencing the experiences of the experience on this continuum on why I'm here. Everything is ever so perfect. I wouldn't change one thing, not even the greatest pains, not even the worst things that I've ever done. I wouldn't change any of it. It's all perfectly aligned. Beautiful. Joe. Oh, I wouldn't actually change anything. I. The only, if I was to do one thing differently, it would just be that I would have written and launched Brock Off sooner. But in terms of who I am, because I used to question, why am I still alive? Like, why was I spared? Why did I not end up on the streets? Why didn't I end up like my mom? Why didn't I end up like those other girls? Uh, I used to really question that. And I call, you know, about... I say in your 30s, I call it, because, uh, you know, entering into the age of question, like, what's my purpose? I'm 56 this year, and I have never felt freer, more joyous, more everything. Uh, but if I was to do only one thing, it would just be to, to launch and, and share sooner, because I want to live to 106, and that means I only got 50 <laughs> And to all of you were invited to my 56th party, or my 56th, my 106 party. <laughs> I picked it, but if you want to know, ask me. But right now, with that being said, the only thing I would do different is launch that story sooner because it is such an honor to work with women and see them transforming their lives and to be part of their journey. That'd be it. Other than that, I wouldn't be where I am today had those things not happened. I wouldn't be living the life I'm intended to, in my opinion live had I not been through that. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't do anything differently. It just is what it is, right? That's beautiful. You know, I've in this book there, as you can see, there's several younger women here, but there's also some that are even younger in their 30s that are in this book. Mm -hmm. And I think back and I thought, oh my goodness, if I could have been there when I was 30. Wow, what a difference. But but we can't let that stop us. If you're 90 years old and haven't told your story, stand up and tell it. Set yourself free from it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we can't we can't look back and say, what if? You know, mm -hmm. we have to look forward and say, what is where I'm going? Yeah. Oh, Edna. Oh, um, what would I do? To her, I would not have gone to church. And I say that because I didn't go because it was something I was supposed to do. I went to be medicated, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I went there to be medicated because I tried everything else. I tried drugs, alcohol, didn't work. So I did the flip side. But I would not have gone to church because like Joe, I would have 
I wrote my book when I was in my 30s, and I left the manuscript for years. Didn't do anything with it um, because of the shame. Mm -hmm. But I definitely would have, if I hadn't gone to church, I possibly would have found the book again, you know, because I was wrapped up in pretending. So I think not going to church and hiding, mm -hmm. that's, what I, that, that's the one thing I would have not have done. Mm -hmm. And just writing, 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 telling, 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 all of that. You know, that's exactly what I, I would want have have done, you know, and that's, that's a blessing to be able to help somebody else because we get so wrapped up, you know, again, we get so wrapped up in our stuff and our pain, but they're waiting for us and we're here now. So that's a good thing. We're here now. We're, we're opening our you know, mouths and giving voice to the secrets. It's a great thing. So that's what it'd be for me. Thank you. Amanda? I think for me, um, anything that I would, I, I would say that I could go back and do again, like, like you guys, I, I maybe would have started a little sooner. However, I'm also a very, very firm believer that every single experience that I've had has shaped who I am today. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't be where I'm at right now in the relationships that I'm at. And I would not have met mm -hmm. the people that are in my life right now if I had done anything differently. So in embracing that, it's um, the, the word freedom has come up with, with multiple of us. And it, it, it does give me the freedom to enjoy life, to know that I'm on the right path. Um, I, I wouldn't have, like I said, I just wouldn't have the relationships and the trust built. So I don't know that there's much more that I would have done differently outside of starting sooner, which would have ultimately resulted in a different end. So, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shannon? Um, I think the thing that I would, have, I would change is I would have told sooner. Um, reason being so I could help more sooner. Um, would have changed me? Probably not. Everything would still be pretty much the same in that aspect. But just the thought of putting my story out there sooner and helping more women. Um, sorry, that's my phone. Um, but helping more women know that it's not their fault. Very good. Thank you. And Roberta? Well, I'm in alignment with everybody. I wouldn't, pretty much I wouldn't change anything because I am who I am because of all the experiences. And I just have to say this, the freedom part of this, my car's name is Freedom, so uh, I'm all aligned with the freedom aspect. Um, and I, I do think that I didn't understand my story until much later, um, for whatever reason. So I think you come to things when you come to things. And you can be helpful when you understand yourself. And if that takes you know, 30 years or 50 years or whatever, you are who you are and you're where you're at. And honor yourself for that. And you have to honor yourself as well. Very good. Mm -hmm. So I'll start this next question with you, Roberta. Okay. What words of wisdom do you want to share with those who are just now choosing to start their journey of healing? Well, you know the first word I'm going to say, right? Breathe. Yeah. Breathe. Yeah. Be gentle with yourself. When you hear that negative self-talk in your head, try to change it. I know it's difficult. I know. I know the negative self-talk. It sits in a tiny little corner in the back of all of our heads, as healthy as we all can be. Mm -hmm. But it does every once in a while. You know, it sneaks up and says, well, you know. But you just have to be more gentle with yourself because, Everybody being hard on you and being abusive towards you, whatever that abuse may be, if you're abusing yourself, you're part of the cycle. Mm -hmm. And I know that it all sounds really simplistic. It isn't simple. And it takes forever. And it takes digging in. And it takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And I can honestly say, even though every once in a while there's a trigger, 
and there's been a couple in the last couple weeks. Um, I'm as healthy as I have ever been, as free as I've ever been, and um, receptive to criticism, uh, constructive or otherwise, um, and not hard on myself anymore. And it really, uh, I, it's such a relief. It's such a relief. Mm -hmm. Very good. Amanda? Um, I want to say persistence is the one thing that I would say. Um, in, in the journey for me, I know that there's been a lot of step forwards, but sometimes there's those times when you take two steps forward and then it feels like you're slammed five steps back. And then you feel like you have to kind of regroup and restart and it, it takes persistence and just constantly telling yourself that you're making the right decisions. You're um, trusting in yourself to grow and it, it is a, it's a process and it's not a smooth process necessarily. It's not an mm -hmm. easy process, but the rewards on the other side of it are so great that the work is very worth it. And just to start taking that one step and just keep moving in a general direction of forward and you'll eventually get there. Mm. Cool. There are a lot of triggers, aren't there? Absolutely. Oh there, my gosh, yeah. There are yeah. triggers and they can kind of take us by surprise sometimes. Yes, they know? absolutely can. Yeah. 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 Edna? Oh, I don't know. So the question is, uh, what words of wisdom would you share with somebody starting that healing journey? For me, um, it's always recovering. You're always recovering. You're always you know, like um, the last speaker Amanda said, it's there's always there's not always going to be great days, you know, and we need to know that that the all all the days are not going to be good, and even during the thriving times, there's going to be some rain, mm -hmm. but you have to be able to embrace the emotional part and go with that emotion because that's you, you know, that's part of you, and. Go through the process. I think that's what's important. Go through the process. Mm -hmm. Loving yourself through the ring. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, Shannon? Um, just to know that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. You're not the only one. And don't be afraid because that's the biggest thing I think a lot of us go through is we're afraid. And they just need that that knowing that it's okay to talk and don't be afraid to tell somebody to talk to whether it's just one person that that one person don't be afraid to tell them and trust them and, and that you're not alone so that that's because for me that's what it was I was I wasn't trusting I didn't know what to say and I thought I'm the only one so just just to know that is the biggest thing thank you mm -hmm. Tracy don't be quiet. <laughs> However, create the space to get quiet. Meditate. Connect with your body. Go within. All of our answers lie within. Our body is a miraculous healer of itself. What I do is in my meditation, I connect with my inner child, my perfect child within. And I ask her, what message do you have for me today? Because I strongly believe that all of our trauma dramas, our aches and pain, our illness, all of the, the bad feeling from arthritis to Hashimoto's to, to Crohn's disease, whatever it is, that I believe that they are created from the emotionality of our unexpressed emotions. And we can go in and connect with our body on the cellular level and release and clear the cellular memory and cellular memorization of those trauma dramas and, and clear that emotionality. Connect, mm -hmm. meditate. Your body knows everything that it re desires, requires, and deserves to have for itself. Listen. Listen to the voice within. And don't be quiet any longer. Let it out. You have a voice. You have a light. You have a gift that deserves to be shared to the world. And by giving that gift to others, the biggest gift is the reflection in the mirror back to yourself. Oh, and very self -love much. And self-connection. Cool. Mm -hmm. And Joe? 
Well, in the words of Nike, just do it, uh, <laughs> which sounds so very simplistic, doesn't it? Um, I would agree with everything that's been said. Mm -hmm. I, I believe, and, and I know, Becky, you and I talked about this many, many times, that we all need to stand on our stories and not in them. Uh, when we stand in the story, we, we continue that story. We just keep perpetuating the same thing. It's like you wallow. Yeah, exactly. So we need to stand on the story. And I think it does, it requires courage. It requires a lot of grit because you're going to have those dark days. I agree with that as well. And it requires grace, grace for yourself and grace for those that are just learning about what you've been through because they have a perception of who you are. And those, they, when we tell our stories, as much as it does good, it also it gets people to sh sort of shake to their core in who they mm -hmm. thought we were. And so to be graceful for ourselves, to be graceful to those that were intended to serve, and to have the courage to stand on the story and not in it, I think that is the single biggest gift I've get, I know that's the biggest gift I've given myself. And that's what I want. And that's what you've, Becky, what you've done in doing this is allowed all of us to stand on it, not in it. And in it is, is icky. It's stinky. It's, you know, there's the articulate Joe, the writer, three books, and I can't. Icky and stinky. <laughs> <laughs> so how about just beautiful loving and graceful that's what i i mean I, that's what i'd like to be remembered for well in my mind this is a, a movement that we have going here and this is women locking arms joining arms and saying we can do this and we can help others to do the same but i don't want to not acknowledge the men that have faced the very same things mm -hmm. because honestly if there are men listening the statistics and which are totally inaccurate is one in three girls and one in five boys. And one of the most heartwarming things that I had happen when I released my own book, The Woman I Love, was the men that came to me and said, thank you. That's the biggest source of healing I have ever experienced in my life. To be able to understand what happened to me and see it portrayed from a different perspective because they were abused so badly as in, in their childhood. So we're not we don't hold a corner on the market as far as um the abuse that suffered whether you're a man or a woman but what we can do is realize that we can stand up we can heal we can be well and our voices are rising in unison to share that message and what i'm seeing happening just on facebook today is like it's just it's going far and wide and this is what we want and we want to wrap our arms together and say, come join us, be with us, start their healing process. Because the more of us that do this, it changes the whole frequency of the world we live in. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're after. Cool. So thank you, ladies. We're so excited. We are already number one bestsellers. <laughs> Internationally. <laughs> Internationally. Canada it's, and the USA. Yeah, and uh, well, it's and actually the book is in, um, all the markets as far as international. So I have somebody watching for Germany and for Australia. We, in fact, one of our authors is from Australia, um, for, for the UK, for Canada. So it's, it's happening and we are so excited and I feel so blessed by each one of you that you would share your hearts this way and that we're all here together. Thank, thank you. you for putting this together. Mm -hmm. Namaste. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, All right. Becky. Thank, Thank you. Becky. So we'll Thank end you, our call. We and for our yes. listeners, we send you our love. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.